Okay, wonderful. Good to see you all. Wow, what a great number of people. And uh, when Aaron told me how many were booked in, I was just thrilled um, because this is a great subject. And one even that I've noticed uh, we rarely talk about in the modern church. And yet it's an idea that absolutely dominates the New Testament text. So uh, so we, we've got three weeks together. We've got uh, this week. Next week is a little break uh, because I'm unfortunately I was already uh, booked in to teach down in Wales. And then we've got uh, the last two Wednesdays in March. And we'll cover this subject, um, at least aspects of it, uh, simply entitled The Return over those uh, three sessions. Now, I'm looking across the room, so there's probably a wide range of experience. There will be people in the room, and you've already got a lot of views on what this looks like and ideas of what uh, certain things may mean and how we as Christians think about it. For other people in the room, this could be the very first conversation you've had around the return of Jesus. And then we may have a bunch of people in the middle. Okay, so, so I'm, 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 I'm conscious of the range in the room. And let me say what I always like to say in gatherings like this, when I have the privilege of in some way guiding a conversation, because that's what I want to do. I'm not here to tell you what to think about the return of Jesus. What I would like to help with is frame the way we think about the return of Jesus. And then if there's a whole bunch of sort of things that you want to fill in or dots you want to connect or views you have, well then that, that fits within that framework around that. And so my, my hope and desire is that I can guide a conversation and just get you thinking about something that the New Testament has a tremendous amount to say to us. Uh, there'll be a whole bunch of stuff you may not agree with on with me on, and that's absolutely fine. I'm always shocked if everybody does agree with me, and I would not expect you to agree with everything. But again, we've created a safe space in this place where we can just think about this stuff, reflect on it. And for some of us, it will open up a gateway for us to dig deeper and chase a few more ideas. For others, perhaps what we'll discuss over the next three sessions will just satisfy you in terms of right I've got an understanding of what that looks like for me as a follower of Jesus so uh, so hopefully hopefully you'll enjoy it no matter what we do and and we will see so shall we jump in uh, we'll lean in let's get to it so we're going to take a reading from Matthew chapter 24 now let me say something about this reading before we read it um, which will help us we're going to base um, our a foundational springboard thinking on the return of Jesus from the words of Jesus. I reckon that's the best place to start and that should be our framework. If there is someone who knows uh, the stuff that we need to know about his return, it's the person who's going to return. All right. Uh, and there's a lot of views out there. But when I look at the teaching of Jesus, I find real comfort from ideas that are, though they represent complexity, these ideas are actually relatively simple. And Jesus positions his return in these relatively simple frameworks so that you and I can hang our faith on that. And then whatever comes our way, we're thinking about it through that lens. Now, Matthew 24 and Matthew 25, you really need to read those two chapters together. So in Matthew 24, um, we've got a mix of Jesus talking about events which are clearly leaning towards the destruction of Jerusalem, which happens in AD 70, which we'll come back to. And then Jesus is obviously then talking about wider events, global events that are speaking to the whole world, not just to a Jewish centric worldview. And, and then he goes straight from chapter 24, what we call 24, straight into 25. And there are significant parables in Matthew 25 that don't make sense unless you read Matthew 24. Now that's really, really important. So you've got parables like the 10 virgins we'll touch on tonight, parables like the talents, parables like the sheep and the goats. They, if they're taken out of the context of Matthew 24, we end up making them say something that I don't think Jean Jesus meant to say. And so the, the, we've got almost, if you like, 
the directives of Jesus in 24 and then in chapter 25, we've got parables that help us think about those ideas. And what I'll try and do over the three weeks is connect those two chapters continuously together for you. All right. So just for sake of time, we're going to jump in. As you can see on the screen, we'll jump in at verse 36. And we, these are all the words of Jesus. So here we go. So Jesus speaking to his disciples, he says, but about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, listen to this, nor the son, but only the father. Now there's a head banger right there as we begin. As it was in the days of Noah, so it will be at the coming of the son of man. For in the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. And they knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. This is how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with a hand mill. One will be taken and the other left. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. But understand this, if the owner of the house had known at what time of night the thief was coming, he would have kept watch and would have not let his house be broken into. So you also must be ready because the Son of Man will come at an hour when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful and wise servant whom the master has put in charge of the servants in his household to give them their food at the proper time? It will be good for that servant whose master finds him doing so when he returns. Truly, I tell you, he will put him in charge of all his possessions. But suppose that servant is wicked and says to himself, my master is staying away a long time. And he then begins to beat his fellow servants and to eat and drink with drunkards. The master of that servant will come on a day when he does not expect him and at an hour he is not aware of. This is where it gets a bit edgy. He will cut him to pieces and assign him a place with the hypocrites where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And then, of course, we go into chapter 25 and you've got those those parables, which we'll touch on in just a moment uh, as we go forward. Now, when we look at the New Testament, the New Testament gloriously tops and tails its message with the coming of Jesus. So when we look at Matthew chapter 1, the, in chronological order, uh, the first gospel of the New Testament, Matthew introduces Jesus as Emmanuel, with us is God. And we would refer to that in, in broad terms as the first coming of Jesus in that respect. And then if you go all the way to the end of the book of Revelation, the very final comment being made for us is, Amen, come Lord Jesus. So we get this beautiful sense of symmetry that the gospel, at least the New Testament section of our Bible, is wrapped up in this beautiful first coming of Jesus, as we sang about tonight, the word who left heaven and embodied himself in flesh to save us. And in this glorious hope that the word who came the first time is going to come back a second time and he's going to wrap the whole thing up in this glorious new heaven and new earth new Jerusalem, new creation, and almost this glorious, magnificent reset of the universe in his redemptive purpose. And that's ultimately the trajectory of the New Testament. Having come the first time to save humanity, Jesus then rises from the dead, ascends to heaven with the promise that he will come back and wrap the whole thing up. And in between the beginning and the end of that, the New Testament continuously encourages me and you to think about the return of Jesus as followers of Jesus in the most positive terms possible. So sometimes when we think about the return of Jesus, we're getting a little bit worried and edgy about all the bad stuff that might be coming our way. 
But for the Christian community, the followers of Jesus, we're being encouraged to think about the return of Jesus, not just from the point of view of all the bad stuff, and we'll touch on some of that tonight, but actually from the point of view that all of this is leaning towards this magnificent culmination of human history when Jesus will return and Jesus will take those who love him, those who follow him and those who are his onto himself. And that's a great hope for us. So whatever the details in between those two bits of the Bible, this and the trajectory is positive. All right, we win. (laughs) <laughs> you win. Whatever it's going to look like in heaven, whatever it's going to look like in eternity, and we can have a huge big conversation about that one all by itself. Here's my encouragement to you right at the beginning. The trajectory of the New Testament to those who believe is overwhelmingly positive. And the Jesus who came is also coming back. And in our sophisticated 21st century world that seems to be more on a knife edge than ever, that should be a hope to me and you. And in fact, that's exactly how Paul refers to the second coming of Jesus. When writing to Titus, he refers to the second coming of Jesus, the return of Jesus, as the blessed hope. Your blessed hope, ladies and gentlemen, is not paying off your mortgage. No, that's a good, that's a good idea. I'm hoping to do that myself, right? Our blessed hope is not just drawing down on our pension. Our blessed hope is not just living a long life. The ultimate blessed hope of every person in this room who claims to be a follower of Jesus is that Jesus is coming back. And when Jesus comes back and you are rising up into the air, whether Uh, as a person who is still alive or as one who's already passed and your body comes to meet you as you're gathered up into the air, here's a cast iron guarantee. You will not be thinking about your mortgage. You'll not be thinking about your car. I will not be thinking about my sausage dogs. I'll not be thinking about what's going to happen to my stuff. And this is actually the point of the blessed hope. The point of the blessed hope is to remind us that our lives are bigger than this stuff. That your life is bigger than what's going on around us. Now, the things that are happening to me and you and the things that are happening to our country and the things that are happening to our world, are they important? Are they, should they be things we think about? Of course, and we're going to think about that. But the whole idea is to keep reminding you, to keep reminding me that he is on with something bigger than all of this. And that should keep then the good days and the bad days and the ugly days in perspective. That one day a trumpet will blow and this will all be done. And that's a good thing. Now I want to tell you, I am looking forward more to the return of Jesus right now than I've ever done in my entire life. And I'm more convinced that I was raised in a church where we taught this stuff virtually every week. There was hardly a week went by when somebody didn't mention the return of Jesus. Now, some of you know I love football. I mean, I I heard sermons where where people would teach, if you're caught in Windsor Park, which which was the football ground of our local team, Linfield, if you're in Windsor Park when Jesus comes back, you'll be left behind. (laughs) If you're in the cinema, when the trumpet blows, you're done. So I hope the movie was a good one because that's the last thing you're ever going to watch. All right. Now, now I, I don't agree with any of that. But the point I'm making is this was part of the continuous narrative of my upbringing. And now today in our 21st century world, in the Western church, I hardly hear it mentioned It's almost as if for modern Christians, Jesus is coming back, but we don't need to talk about that stuff. But let me show you this from the New Testament. This is absolutely staggering for us to consider, just to put the whole thing in perspective for you. When you look at the New Testament, there are 260 chapters, okay? And the return is mentioned in those 260 chapters 318 times. All right, that means it's pretty important. Keeps popping up. If we break this down into verses for you, one in every 25 verses in the New Testament part of the Bible 
deals with the return of Jesus. It's a quarter of its wordage is dealing with the return of Jesus. And then this one, I, I just think is, is incredible. Break this down for you that every book in the New Testament, except Galatians, Philemon, and 2nd and 3rd John, mentions the second coming of Jesus. All right? Now, I say that by way of introduction because I want you to understand whatever you end up thinking about the details of the return and what's going to happen exactly before that and can we correlate the book of Revelation to the news report tonight, whether we can do all of that stuff or not or whether all of that is possible, the point is this, that for any casual reading of the New Testament, the return of Jesus is one of the dominant ideas for the writers of the New Testament and therefore should be a dominant idea for me and you. Are you with me? And so if we're not talking about it, we should ask why. Now, I've got a couple of theories why we don't talk about it very much, especially in the Western world. Here's what I've discovered, that the Western world has by and large become very prosperous, Post-Second World War, the Western world has been very prosperous. We've just had our, is it a mini budget or a budget today? And I don't know how you've done with that or what you like about that or don't like about that. We're not talking about that. Um, but but, but you've, you've got all of that going on. And somebody on the, on the radio said, you know, our, the state of our country, uh, we, we should be doing better as one of the richest countries in the world. It's still, I'm still amazed that people think we're rich. When, when we're broke, our country's actually broke, you know, our government's broke. But we, we are wealthier today, better off today, even with all our challenges in Britain, than we've ever been in our entire history in terms of potential excess to wealth. And that's replicated right across the Western world. With that growth of financial prosperity in the Western world, the church has generally prospered. Assemblies of God in the USA has $1 billion in the bank. You're a hard crowd to impress. I thought that was a lot of money, but clearly not in Bolton. Okay, so this is a Pentecostal denomination that didn't exist in 1914. And most of our Pentecostal forefathers and foremothers hadn't got two cents to rub together. And we've got Assemblies of God USA has, this is not including the buildings, $1 billion in the bank. Wow. Now, when you've got that much money in the bank, here's the danger. It's good here. Life's good here. Let's enjoy life here. And the more we start to enjoy life here, the less we think about the life to come. There is a definite correlation, ladies and gentlemen, between the growth uh, of prosperity and the decrease of our eschatology. Now, John, what do you mean eschatology? Eschatology is the study of end times, broadly speaking. So here's the correlation, that the more prosperous we become collectively or individually, the less we're thinking about the return. I heard a Christian say not so long ago, I'm really enjoying my life. I'm hoping Jesus doesn't come back anytime soon because I'm really enjoying it. Now, of course, if you're enjoying life, totally get that. We're all laughing because we're going, yeah, absolutely. So if life's good, but here's the other side of that equation. I've traveled all over the world and I've ministered in places like Sudan. In fact, my cousin Paul and I were talking about Vietnam and Cambodia and Thailand where his son is going to visit. And I've been to Cambodia. And in countries like that, when I ministered, where there was was heavy persecution against the church and suffering for the church, eschatology is high. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So when we're suffering, it's even so come Lord Jesus. But when we're prospering, ah, take your time. It's okay. It's fine. I'm really enjoying my life here. Now, please forgive me for the generalizations, but I think that's definitely been a factor as to why people like us, good card-carrying Pentecostals, who are famous for our eschatology, 
We're famous for believing that Jesus is coming again and he's coming again very quickly. Um, that we've sort of decreased our chatter about that. And I think it's partly to do with the emphasis of and the acceptance of a more prosperity oriented worldview, which is great if you've got it. Not so good if you don't. So I was in Sudan and I remember speaking at a pastor's conference. A hundred pastors made it to that conference. It took many of the pastors a minimum of four days walking to get to that conference. Now, when I say conference, it was in a huge sort of a, a wooden hut in the middle of Sudan, um, in the middle of nowhere. It was one of the most difficult trips physically I've ever done. And I was asked to do some teaching for the pastors. And I'm trying to teach the Bible to a hundred pastors. And there are 10 Bibles between them. And the reason they've only got 10 between them is because they can't get them. Uh, either because of persecution or because of financial uh, inhibitions. And it's quite a staggering thing that I'm standing there with the Bible and there's 90 pastors who don't even own one. And they're literally taking pages out of each other's Bible and copying them down. All of those pastors, without exception, had suffered physical persecution and many members of their congregations and families had been killed because of simply being a Christian. When they worshipped, they were constantly worshipping about deliverance, set us free, help us, O oh God, come Lord Jesus. It was absolutely staggering. It was one of the most staggering moments of my life. And it really was a bit of an epiphany moment to me because even, even back then, we weren't talking a lot about the return of Jesus. And I listened to these pastors and that's all they were talking about, Jesus come back. So you get this correlation between prosperity, the more prosperous we are, the less urgent we are about the return. The more life gets difficult, the more we think about, ooh, one day Jesus is coming back. And then the other thing I think that's hurt us over the years is, is maybe a bit of disappointment around some of the extremes on prophetic interpretation. Like, you know, I, I'm, I'm old enough to remember like the 10 horns being the 10 countries in the EU. This was a sign, 10 countries in the EU. This is the Antichrist is coming right now. And now we know that was a bit, a bit naff. Are you with me? Now, I don't want to despise that, but I think that's hurt us a bit because we got a little bit in the detail on the return of Jesus to such an extent that we try to, we've tried to interpret every idea and nuance of the scripture and find what that is right now in society. Next, next time, we'll talk about the mark of the beast. We'll talk about how to read the book of Revelation. Ah, it's been a difficult one for people. Six, six, six. What's going on there? What does that mean? Does that mean barcodes, holograms? Does that, I, I, and, and we have these sorts of, because here's what we're trying to do. We're trying to grab ideas and then where is that in our modern world? And sometimes there is a correlation, sometimes there's not. And I think trying to force a square peg into a round hole has sort of put people off a little bit, leaning into the big ideas. When we come back to Jesus, and this is why I've started with Jesus, and this is why I want us to frame our conversation tonight around Jesus, is that Jesus makes the ideas really pretty simple. Now, there's a lot of details swirling underneath these ideas, but the ideas themselves are pretty simple. And here's, here's let, let, let me sort of summarize them and then we'll, we'll jump in. Is that okay? You with me? Yeah. All right, you're doing great. First idea is this, um, Jesus' return will be visible. Okay. Now, look at what, what it says uh, within the context of our scriptures and, and how we learn. It says this, verse 30 of, of, of Matthew 24, at that time, the son of man will appear in the sky and all the nations will mourn. They will see the son of man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. So first big idea, dead simple, just tuck it away, put it somewhere and lock it in, is that when Jesus comes back, we'll know. And Paul even has to dig into this for the early church because there were rumors going around that Jesus had already sort of returned. And Paul says, no, nah, no, nah, no, listen, when Jesus comes back, we will all know about that. 
Why? Because Jesus himself says it's going to be a visible return. And somehow, whatever way that's going to work, the implication is that everyone will see the return of Jesus. Now, whether they're ready for it or not is a different conversation, but they will see it. Second thing I want you to see, big, big idea, is that the return of Jesus will be physical. It will be a literal, physical return, and it will involve, even for us, our own physicality according to the words of Jesus. Look at what it says in verse 31 of Matthew 24. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather the elect from the four winds and from one end of the heavens to the other. Now, I'm not sure what that's all going to look like or how that's all going to work, but here's how I understand it, that wherever you are and whatever condition you are in, you are going to be physically gathered to him. And he's going to find a way to ensure that every believer who is alive at his return or those who have gone before us and are, have passed on, that actually all of those will be gathered together in his name. And that's, that's a supernatural idea that will make your head hurt a little bit, but that's the promise that Jesus is offering. Everyone will experience the return. Nobody will be in any doubt and then lastly, it will be sudden. I don't know if you noticed in our reading, that came over over and over again. So we've got this paradox with the return of Jesus. He keeps telling us these are the ideas to look for that point to the son's return. But exactly when the son returns, I can't tell you. Now, it would have been really helpful if Jesus had have said, I'm going to return on the 17th of March, 2024. St. Patrick's Day, of course, which would be a great day for Jesus to return, especially for all in green. So that would be marvelous. But he doesn't do that. In fact, he even uh, hints very strongly, and this is a, a head bender, that he doesn't even know the date. Which... Okay, so we're interpreting that in terms of Jesus' humanity, that he didn't know that date. As God, of course, he knows all things. But he's saying, I don't even know that, only the Father knows that. Now, I think he's saying that to help us understand that we've got to hold in tension this idea, that he's, he's about to show to us that there are big signs that we should look for that are pointing to the fact that he is definitely closer and coming but none of us should get into the idea of trying to work out the date. Leave that stuff alone. Leave it alone. It's made us look really stupid. And it's made us look foolish. Once you start trying to put a date on something that not even Jesus knows, you're setting yourself up for a kicking. Leave it alone. Are you with me? All I know is this, and it's Pretty obvious, but it's true. His return is closer than it's ever been. How close? Not sure. But the signs are pointing, it's pretty close. Now, pretty close to God could be one day or a thousand years. Because <laughs> like God's not really limited by our clocks and watches. So it's a hard one for us. But what I know is that when he does come, it will be sudden. And the implication is that even for those who are ready, they will be surprised. Not surprised in that they're not ready, because they'll be ready, but surprised in that, oh wow, it's today. <laughs> but here's the problem, ladies and gentlemen, and this is, this is sort of slightly exciting and also slightly scary. By the time you realize it's here, it's done. <laughs> yeah. So if you blink your eye, it's going to be that quick. So we won't have time to do anything. When he returns, it's how we are at that moment is how we go or don't. That's a pretty exciting, slightly scary thought, isn't it? Uh, that's back to Windsor Park and the cinema sort of conversation, which I don't agree with, but I sort of understand the nuance of why they said that to us, to keep us on the straight and narrow. Here's what Jesus says in the context. Two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding with the handmill. One will be taken 
and the other left. So here's what Jesus is teaching. Three big ideas that when it comes to his return, it will be visible, it will be physical, and it will be sudden. Okay? And, and what do we do with that? We just, we just put that somewhere. Just frame that in your thinking. That actually, uh, when Jesus returns, we will know, but he will return so suddenly that, that none of us will have time to do anything about it. And therefore, that's why we have to live ready for his return. Make sense? You with me so far? Is that okay? Now, many in the room may already sort of know these sorts of things, but, but it's just to try and help us. Now, in the teaching of Jesus, especially from Matthew 24, dropping down a little bit, I think Jesus gives us three profound words of advice about his return that we should lead into. And they're the three words that I'm going to work on uh, over the three weeks. If you were to summarize the teaching of Jesus in Matthew 24 and the equivalent passage in Luke 21, Jesus essentially tells his young community of believers that when it comes to his return, three pieces of advice. Watch, wait, and work. Now we're going to break that down. We're going to ask the question, what does watching look like, waiting look like, and working look like? And we're going to do it by, by jumping in, not only to the teaching of Jesus, but different parts of the biblical text in order to help us. Now here's what, here's what I hope to do. I want to try and help us think about the return of Jesus in the way that the early church thought about the return of Jesus. Okay. Now, the details of what they had and the details of what we had are hugely different, but the principles which govern both communities are the same. So we may have the internet and they didn't. We may have the possibility of A and B and they didn't. But actually, how we think about those things is more important than just what we think about. Okay? And for me as a follower of Jesus, having stepped back from the detail a little bit of the return and grabbed hold of the big framing ideas, I now step forward into details which I may or may not understand with more confidence. Because actually, whether I understand that or not, whether I get that or not, whether that is part of the story or not, I've got enough of the framework in play that none of those things are going to dissuade me or disrupt me or dismantle my journey as a believer in Jesus. And so, listen, I, personally, this is how I am trying to live. I'm trying to watch, watch out for the things that Jesus warned us about and just take note. Oh, that's interesting. I'm trying to wait, but wait actively towards what does waiting with expectation look like. And next time we'll look at the book of Revelation and how to approach that in terms of how we read Revelation or how I read it. And then you can agree or disagree uh, with that and then work. In view of Jesus' return, what does that look like? Is that okay? So let's lean in then. Let's move. Now that we've sort of set, set the frame, let's do a, a little bit of work on this. So first thing I think that Jesus is encouraging us to do is to watch. Now, the reason I've put the word continuously there is because when Jesus says in our verse, verse 42, therefore keep watch. The way that is constructed in the Greek text, it's the idea of an imperative. It's a command. It's not, he's not saying, well, if you've got a bit of time, have a wee look. No, no. He's saying, watch, command. And he's saying, watch continuously. So it is the responsibility of the community of faith to continuously be watching. All right. Now, in the world of Jesus, many cities had a watchtower. And the idea of the watchtower was that someone would climb up that watchtower and scan the horizon. What you didn't want is to be alerted to someone coming against your city when they were banging on the gate. That's too late. <laughs> we want to know if they're like miles away. So the idea of the watchtower was to continuously scan 
the horizon. And Jesus is picking up this idea when he says to us in verse 42, therefore keep watch because you do not know on what day your Lord will come. So because we don't know when he's coming, we need to watch continuously for the clues. Is that okay? And so as a Christian community, we mustn't be obsessed with this because it's not the only thing we're meant to do. But we must not neglect it because it's an important part of our idea. I, I, I love to travel, uh, but uh, my family will tell you I'm a control freak when I travel. I'm not a great person to travel with. If you're one of those people likes to chill in the lounge until your name is called, you can't travel with me. We will fall out. I will kill you. You won't get on the plane. And uh, they'll be calling your name because you're dead. Um, and I've already got on the plane. So I'm a bit of a control freak. I like to get to the airport early. I like to chill in the lounge. I like to get to the gate in plenty of time. Make sure the bladder is empty before I get on the... You know, the whole thing. I'm, I'm there. And one of the things I've noticed is that um, I'm, I'm in the habit of scanning... Constantly. Now that we've got travel apps, of course, it makes it slightly easier. But I used to position myself in the lounge where I could see the board. Who's with me? Am I the only weirdo in the room? No, come on. Is there anyone else like me? Only a few of us, right? So, so you can travel with me. None of you can travel with me, right? Leave me alone, right? And I position myself in such a place where I can see the board because I'm looking for that, my flight to go green, once it goes green, gate is open and I can go. And I don't hang around, I just, I just go. And that's a little bit like this. So when I'm sitting in the lounge, having a nice cup of coffee and enjoying my lounge pass program, which my wife bought me, which is absolutely luxurious and marvelous, even when you're traveling economy, having a lounge, you feel like a business class traveler, uh, even though you're traveling economy. And I'm sitting in that lovely lounge, enjoying food and stuff like that. I'm enjoying the food, but I've got one eye on the board. That's what Jesus means. Keep an eye on the board. Right? Don't get obsessed with the board because you get obsessed with the board, you're going to ignore the coffee and the buns and the people in your world. You're going to end up missing the good things right in front of you. So don't get obsessed, but have one eye on the board. Keep looking because that's what he is after. And as if to ram that point home, when we go into Matthew 25, he tells this weird story, interesting story, culturally relevant to his day, a bit weird for me and you, of 10 virgins waiting for the bridegroom. And as the bridegroom is about to process through the town and bring his bride home and celebrate the wedding, these virgins are waiting for the bridegroom to come. And, the, and he takes so long coming that they sort of have a bit of a doze. And then suddenly there's a call, he's coming. And the 10 virgins wake up and start to trim their lamps and five of them realize, hey, hold on a minute, we're a bit low on oil. And so they say to their friends, any chance you could lend us some oil? And the, ten, the, the five wise virgins said, on your bike, there's no way you're having our oil. If we give to you, we'll not have enough. Go and buy some, go and get some, go and, go and sort it out yourself. But of course, the inevitable happens. When they go to get the oil, the bridegroom comes and the five who are ready are taken into the celebration. And it says this, the door is shut. And then when the five foolish bang on the door and say, hey, let us in, the response says, I'm sorry, I don't know who you are. You can't come in. The door is shut. And look how Jesus concludes the parable. Almost identical words. He says, therefore, keep watch because you do not know the day or the hour. Now, here's the paradox for me and you as followers of Jesus. We don't know, but we sort of know. So we don't know the day, but Jesus has given us, and the New Testament has given us, enough clues to remind us, eye on the board. It's going to go green any minute now. The gate will come up soon. But you've got to keep your eye on the board. 
And if we take our eye on the board, you're going to end up being one of those passengers. Well, Mr. Seamus O'Flynn, please report now to the Ryanair desk. Your gate is closing. I mean, the amount of people who must miss their flights having already checked in is quite incredible. We're about to take your bags off the plane, Mr. O'Flynn. Will you come to the gate? Mr. O'Flynn, your bags are off the plane. Enjoy wherever you are. You've missed your flight. Uh, and it's someone sitting somewhere in the airport, having done all the hard work of getting there, has now missed the plane. Why? Because they just weren't watching. Now, we as a Christian community are charged by Jesus, commanded watch and there's two reasons that we're commanded to do that one is to keep us encouraged Jesus is coming back the board's going to go green any minute now let's keep going let's keep helping each other let's keep blessing each other but also we're keeping our eye on the board for the world we're trying to reach we actually want to reach our world and touch our world. And in order to do that effectively, we need to realize that that return is part of that conversation uh, in us. Here's what Paul says. Here's how Paul frames it. Speaking to the church at Thessalonica, we'll lean into this passage in later sessions. Paul says this, but you brothers are not in darkness so that that day should overtake you like a thief. Now, having read Jesus in Matthew 24, there is a definite allusion from Paul to Jesus. Paul is picking up on the thief idea which Jesus has touched on. If you knew when the thief was going to break into your house, you'd be waiting for them, right? Um, but because you don't know, then actually the thief takes you by surprise. Paul says that actually we are people not in darkness. We're not ignorant of what's going on and therefore that day should not overtake us like a thief. Are you with me? So we've got a paradox. We don't know exactly when Jesus is going to rock up and save the world and consume, uh, consummate all things for his glory. But we've got some stuff that's making us look at the board. So what is that stuff? Well, here's five big signs that Jesus tells us to watch for on the board. Are you ready? We'll just move through these pretty quickly, but they're fairly, fairly dynamic. First of all, Jesus warns us that as his return gets closer, there will be an increase of spiritual deception. Now look at his words coming up on the screen for you. Watch out, he says, that no one deceives you for many will come in my name claiming I am the Messiah and will deceive many. So in our world today, we have an explosion of spirituality right across the piece. So from official like bona fide religions and isms that that are identified in our world right through to the weirdest and wackiest ideas that can find a bit of traction and space on the internet. And the reason we have an explosion in spirituality is because people are fundamentally spiritual and they're hungry and they're searching. And here's what I've discovered. Now, please forgive me. Don't hope this doesn't offend anybody, but, but I've discovered this, that when you're really, really thirsty, you'll drink anything. And, and people say to me, if there's only one God and one Jesus and one Savior, why are there so many religions in the world? It's because people are thirsty. People are hungry. People are searching. And people that are thirsty, hungry, and searching are open to being exploited, manipulated, and abused by anyone who's going to offer them a Messiah complex, a Messiah way out of their difficulties. And that's why we as a church, we need to keep strong with the proclamation of our message because there are people that are desperately searching for hope yes. in our world. And we as a Christian community have not only got the hope of the resurrection of Jesus, which gives us life right now, but we've got the hope of the return of Jesus, which offers them uh, hope for eternity. And we mustn't back off that idea. We're coming up to, to Easter. We're, we're coming up to celebrate the death and resurrection of Jesus. But remember, when Jesus rose from the dead, he ascended to heaven with the promise, I'm coming back. 
And the point of that resurrection was to enable him to ultimately save the world and those who trust in him. First big idea, first big sign. And, and we're seeing an explosion of that in all shapes and sizes right across our world. Um, even in ideologies that we would maybe not call spiritual, but they are ideologies that nonetheless have a religious or spiritual-esque feel to them. And that's exploding all over our world. Secondly, global conflict. So look at the words of Jesus in the context of this. He says this, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Easy for you to say, Jesus. Such things must happen, but the end is still to come. Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. Now, in the days when Jesus spoke, there were wars. And there have been many, many wars since the death and resurrection of Jesus. In fact, it's been estimated that since the end of World War II in 1945, there hasn't been a single day of non-conflict on planet Earth. Now, here's, here's the difference that's happening a uh, hundred years ago, 200 years ago, um, Russia and Ukraine could have had a war and we would never have known about it. Yeah, yeah. Or we would have known about it months and months and months and months later when there was some sort of impact or trickle down or awareness. Now, every single conflict in the world is not only televised and publicized and I mean literally ladies and gentlemen if if you're this way disposed you can hook onto certain websites and literally see webcam of people in war killing one another right that stuff's out there it's ghoulish it's wicked and dark but that's actually possible a hundred years ago that was, that was science fiction now, you can sit in the comfort of your room and actually be connected informationally to things that are happening in parts of the world you'll never visit and never even knew existed. The second thing that has changed is relatively minor global events now affect us all. So, probably until the Israel-Gaza war, no, no, very few people in this room would have heard of the Houthis. Now, we all know about the Houthis. And the reason we know about them is because goods going through the Red Sea can no longer get through the Red Sea because a bunch of people are attacking boats from the West because of the Israel-Gaza war, because the perception is the West is supporting Israel. And now suddenly our boats are being attacked, our, our lovely goods that we've ordered are being jeopardized, and now boats are having to go a long way round in order to get to us, driving prices up, making life uncomfortable for me and you, and generally being an inconvenience to us. Right? 100 years ago, that wouldn't have been a problem. Today, if someone sneezes, you used to say if, if America sneezes, the world catches the cold. Now, now listen, uh, something could happen in a relatively small country in Africa or the Middle East, and me and you are now impacted. That's how it's changed. So it's not war in itself that is the sign, I think. It's the intensity of the impact of wars and rumors of wars that's happening on the globe. And me and you are more susceptible to global influence of war and conflict than we have ever been in our entire lives. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. That's how I read this sign. Here's the third one, natural disasters. Oh, come on. All good news tonight. I'm sorry about this. All good news, natural disasters. Now look, look again what Jesus says. There will be famines and earthquake quakes in various places. Now again, to the audience that Jesus was speaking to, there would have been nothing radical about that. They, they would know of famine. Some of them would have experienced famine. You can go to parts of Israel. I went to Mount, Mount Arval, which was literally split down the middle by an earthquake that happened 500 years before and changed the landscape of Northern Galilee. So these people were aware that famines and things like earthquakes happen. But of course, what's happening today is the intensification of those ideas. Now, some of that may be man or human induced, and maybe our abuse and behavior on the planet may, may be affecting what's happening in our world. And there's a whole worldview out there that would agree and disagree with that position. But there is no doubt about it that in our world today, we're experiencing more extreme events 
that are affecting more people more dramatically. All right? Now, that could be just a coincidence. But with an eye on the board, I'm thinking, is that a sign? And how do I respond to that sign as a follower of Jesus? Fourth sign, persecution of the church. Look at what Jesus says in verse 9. Then you will be handed over to be persecuted and put to death and you will be hated by all nations because of me. Now, some people may want to translate that in a very sort of Jewish-centric, uh, anti-Semitic idea, but in the context of the overall conversation, Jesus is clearly speaking about a community of faith beyond the borders of Israel and into a global context. And my goodness, um, it's a profound idea that is happening in our world today that the persecution against the church has intensified and increased at a dramatic level. Now, here's the paradox. There are more Christians alive today than have ever lived in the history of the world up to this point. That's the good news. So the good news, 8 billion people live on the planet approximately and approximately one third of them claim to be followers of Jesus. And they're sort of conservative estimates. So that's amazing, right? On average, they say something like somewhere between 100 and 130,000 people are coming to Christ every day across the globe, all right? All right. Uh, there's some of the numbers being banded around, but with that has been an increase in persecution. I just want to, I want to pause here and just, just give a moment of reflection for our brothers and sisters across uh, the earth. Here's some stats for you to think about. 365 million Christians, according to Open Doors, which uh, this is their primary focus to support the persecuted church in the context of this. These are 2023 stats. 365 million Christians on a daily basis face high levels of persecution and discrimination for simply being a follower of Jesus. That's happening in our world right now. Now, we may want to talk about discrimination and persecution in this country, but I'm talking about open discrimination and persecution happening uh, across uh, the earth, which is an incredible idea. 13 Christians a day died for their faith in 2013. So that's a total, according to Open Doors, of 4,998. When I see a figure like 4,998, I trust that figure. Do you know what I mean? Would have been dead easy to round that up to 5,000. But 4,998 suggests to me they've really done their numbers. These are bona fide martyrdoms and executions for being a follower of Jesus. That happened in 2013. So if that pattern has continued, while we've been sitting here tonight, 13 followers of Jesus have been executed, martyred, or tortured for their faith. You'll never get that on the news, but that's what's happening across the earth. 14,700 churches or church properties were destroyed simply for being Christian places of worship. In fact, in China last year, 10,000 properties, churches, uh, Christian gatherings were officially shut down in the context of that nation. But, but nobody wants to mention that when, it's the, when there's a lot of money involved in the context of that. And then here's an interesting stat for you. Of the 34.5 million people displaced from sub-Saharan Africa, almost half of them are followers of Jesus. All right? That's happening right now. Now, now, when we're sitting in our world, a relatively comfortable world, it's hard to think about all of that, but that's going on right now. Now, now why am I bringing that to you? Well, number one, Jesus is saying, this is going to be a sign. This will happen. And this is intensifying in our world. This isn't getting any easier. This is actually getting worse for followers of Jesus. And, and I would suggest, uh, though 
in the West, it might look different. I would, I would suggest the rings are even tightening on the Christian church in the Western world and certainly in Europe and certainly in some aspects even of our own country. We're, we're facing some, some challenges there. Not to lose sleep over that, but that is happening. Why am I sharing that? Because Jesus said this is going to happen. So what are we doing? We're keeping our eye on the board. These are all signs that Jesus is returning. And from a global perspective, be interesting to hear your views on this. Just watching the clock, make sure we're going to be okay. But your views on this, the top 10 most dangerous countries to be a Christian. What do you reckon? Anyone want to shout out? I know we're recording this, so I want to be careful. But listen, um, what? North Korea, that's number one. Where? Iran, yes, hold on. Let me just find number nine. Afghanistan, number 10. China is actually officially not on the top 10 list. Isn't that amazing? Well, it's not on the top 10 list. Africa's a con, so break that down a wee bit for me. Any particular country in Africa? Nigeria's on the list, number six. Any others? Uh, India's not in the top 10. No. Let me give them for you. In descending order, Afghanistan 10, Iran 9, Sudan 8, Pakistan 7, Nigeria 6, Yemen 5, Eritrea 4, Libya 3, Somalia 2, and North Korea 1. These are dangerous places to be a Christian. All right? Now, ladies and gentlemen, I, I, I'm not sharing that to spook us or to make us uh, 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 sort of upset, but, but this, this is a reality today. So what Jesus spoke 21 centuries ago is now happening, but it's happening at an, an amazingly intensive rate. And here's the fifth sign. And the fifth sign is this, abandonment of faith. So there will be some measure of of even though the church is growing and expanding, also a measure of abandonment. Look at the, the, the words of Jesus, verses 10 to 13 of chapter 24. At that time, many will turn away from the faith and will betray and hate each other. And many false prophets will appear and deceive many people. Because of the increase of wickedness, Jesus said, the, the love of most will grow cold, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. So we're, we've got this paradoxical moment towards the end of the world and the return of Jesus is that you're getting people coming to faith, but also many turning away from the faith. And, and even, even in, in our own journey in the West, I, I've seen an increase in through things like deconstructionism, people losing faith, people walking away from an understanding of who Jesus is and Jesus suggesting that that will simply increase. So how do we summarize all this? These are five big signs that Jesus has given to us. So again, we don't want our, both our eyes fixed on the board and obsess on the board, but we want to keep one eye on the board while doing the other things that we're going to talk about. Jesus teaches us this, it will get worse. Now, that shouldn't make us pessimistic or miserable, just realists. The world is going to get worse. This is going to get worse. All right. Now, I have children, I have grandchildren, and I'm planning that if Jesus doesn't come back, I'll draw a pension at one point and we're investing into the future. But, but I'm also recognizing that the world I live in is getting steadily worse. And even, and some of you may be aware of this, this is a real thing. The doomsday clock. Who's heard of the doomsday clock? This is a real thing uh, formed um, after the dropping of the atomic bomb. Uh, th this officially was formed about two years after the forming of the atomic bomb. In fact, people like Albert Einstein, Einstein and Robert Oppenheimer, who's been a lot in the news recently for getting awards and Oscars, etc. Uh, they were big players in all of this idea. And, and they set every year this clock. And they set this clock, and this is, this is the criteria in which they set it, 
uh, to become a universally recognized indicator of the world's vulnerability to global catastrophe <laughs> by man-made technologies. So these aren't Christians necessarily. These are people looking at the world, looking at the facts, and actually coming up with a, with a doomsday scenario using the sort of idea of the clock going to midnight. On the 23rd of January, 2024, the, the board, the Doomsday Board, there is such a thing, met, and this was their conclusion. The Science and Security Board of the Bulletin of the Atomic Scientists leaves the hands of the Doomsday Clock unchanged due to ominous trends that continue to point the world toward a global catastrophe. The clock is set at 90 seconds to midnight. Now, me and you knew that. If you're reading Jesus, you already knew that. We don't need, I don't need a scientist to look at the world and tell me it's a bit edgy out there. Actually, the words of Jesus and in looking how my world is going, I'm going, wow, this is close. Now, how close? I don't know. What, what 90 seconds could look like? I don't know. Uh, could it be 100 years or one year? I don't know. But the point is, everything that Jesus indicated is now happening and intensifying in our world. And so as a Christian community, we are watching carefully. Now, the good news is, this is giving us a time of grace. <clears throat> and here's, uh, we'll come back to this idea in our final session. And this is very, very important for us, that even though the, the signs are intensifying, and even though godless or non-believing scientists potentially are telling us we're in the last 90 seconds of humanity, that actually Jesus is saying that there is still a period of grace for the world. Look at Jesus' words. He says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then the end will come. So Jesus is now connecting his return to our response. And this is why believing in the return of Jesus is crucial to our missiology. If me and you really believe that Jesus is coming again, then one of the things it will cause us to do is start to invest in the sorts of things that will help people be reached for him. Because we understand this. Number one, he's holding back until the ends of the earth, until another portion of scripture said, until all people groups get to hear the gospel. And he's holding that back. And so our response is looking at the board, looking at the five signs, looking at the intensification of those signs, we need to respond to that, not by building bunkers and, and living under the ground and holding the fort until Jesus returns, but because we know he's confidently going to return, we then arm ourselves with his love and his grace and his mercy, and we get out there into our world and try to reach as many people as possible as the Christian community, no Knowing that that very action is going to speed his return. Now we'll come back to that idea because it's a massive idea and if we're going to understand the return of Jesus in any terms we must understand it from the context of our missional response to the fact that he is coming again and if we really 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 believe he's coming then we will go and I mean when I say we I mean the church which includes me and you as individuals, we will go and we will invest in that going in order to save the world. Does that make sense? Now, I'm looking, I just need a wee bit again. I'm looking at the clock because I did want to touch on Israel. If it's too late, I can do that next time. But we can't talk about the signs without thinking about Israel. But I'm going to need about 10 to 15 minutes. What do you think? You want to do it tonight? Are you okay? All right, brilliant. Okay. So, uh, so, okay, fasten your seatbelts now. This is where it gets uh, a wee bit edgy. Um, because one of the things I've discovered in the church is that when you introduce the idea of Israel into the church, it does tend to polarize the church community. So you're going to have people in the room that are sort of pro-Israel in every way, and you'll have people a bit more 
cautious about Israel. And then there will be those, and maybe not in this room, but in some rooms I've ministered in, who would see uh, Israel ha as having been completely and totally replaced by the church and therefore as an entity and idea no longer relevant or functional. So you've got all of that going on. And of course, Israel, modern Israel, is rarely out of the news. For such a tiny country, <laughs> it really does uh, engender a massive influence and response around the world. It, even as a nation, it polarizes people. And I've had the privilege of being to Israel three times, and it really is a magnificently beautiful country and one worth visiting, not, not just because you're a Bible nerd like me, but also because it's just a great place uh, to visit. But of course, for us as Christians, we can't even pick up the Bible without bumping into Israel. So Israel dominates everything in our world and, and uh, in a good way, it dominates. The writers of the New Testament, all of them are Jews with the exception of Dr. Luke who writes the book of Luke and the book of Acts. So your whole faith has been shaped by Jews, by Israel. The Messiah, Jesus, the savior of the world, a Jew who came out of the Jewish line, the Jewish nation, and has enriched the whole world that we now understand and do. So we can't ignore Israel. We've got to find a place to put it. Now listen to these words that are coming up on the screen, or you can watch these words or read these words. Look at what Jesus says. This is the Lucan version of the Matthew passage that we've read together. Jesus says something really, really interesting. He says, speaking of, of Israel of his day, um, Jerusalem of his day, it says, they will fall by the sword and will be taken as prisoners to all the nations. Jerusalem will be trampled on by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, that literally happened. What is predicted around about AD 30 or 33 by Jesus came to pass in a catastrophic moment in AD 70 when the Romans uh, rampaged and ravaged uh, Jerusalem, literally destroying it, plowing it over, dismantling every brick of the temple. Jesus predicts in Matthew 24 that not one stone would be left upon another and the Romans literally ripped up the foundation stones of the temple and dismantled the whole thing. In fact, if you go to Israel today and you go to the Wailing Wall, they are the remnants of Herod's temple that people uh, pray at and, and worship at. And so these words that Jesus predicted back in the early 30s AD literally came to pass in AD 70. But note the phrase, until the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. Now, we're not really sure what that means. At least I'm not really sure absolutely what that means, but this is what I think it means. Jesus seems to be using like prophet exilic language. So in other words, if you look at the Old Testament, the prophets prophesied a period of exile when Babylon would destroy Jerusalem, but then after 70 years, the people would return. And Jesus is using the same sort of language. They're going to be taken away. Jerusalem will be destroyed. They'll be taken away. But then there will come a moment when the times of the Gentiles are fulfilled. And then the implication is this, they will return. That's the implication, okay? So from the moment Jesus spoke these words, or from AD 70, it takes almost 20 centuries before this actually happens. And on the 14th of May, 1948, a sort of modern miracle happened. Whatever you think of Israel, and some of you will be pro-Israel, some of you will be not so sure, and some of you may be even anti-Israel. Wherever you sit on the spectrum, you cannot ignore this as a colossal, miraculous event. A people group, a minority people group, a very small people group in world population terms, a hated and persecuted people group that literally survived because they clung on to things like the Torah and the community when they were scattered across the earth, somehow managed to return to a land they hadn't been in for over 20 centuries and established what we call today the modern state of Israel. 
a speech by David Ben-Gurion, the first prime minister of Israel. What makes that date even more remarkable, which of course probably everybody in this room will understand, is that this follows a world war in which 6.5 million Jewish people, mostly of European heritage, were annihilated. Now, wherever, whatever you think about Israel, you've got to go, whoa, that's pretty amazing. And I would suggest to you, and I'm going to give you some guidance about how to think about Israel, I would suggest to you, that's a major sign on the board. Jesus says, Jerusalem will be destroyed, the Gentiles will trample over it, but one day the times of the Gentiles will be fulfilled and the implication of the words of Jesus, then there will be a returning. And we have literally seen in the 20th century that returning. Now, whatever you think of the modern state of Israel, you cannot ignore that is pretty remarkable. And I would suggest to you, wherever you sit, that is not a coincidence. That's not just a geopolitical event. That is something that is connected in to end times thinking. And I believe that this is a marker that the church of Jesus Christ should pay attention to and one which ultimately the New Testament refers to. Now, to help us with it, we're going to do this really fast because I know you've, I've been talking a long time, but I'm trying to, trying to give you your money's worth here and cover as much as we can. But uh, if you, one of the things that's going to help us is how do we think about Israel? How do we think about modern Israel? There's a lot of stuff going on. I, I, I had an argument recently with a young man who absolutely, I mean, I just mentioned the word Israel and I thought he was going to beat my face in because of what he thinks of Israel. Um, and and um, it was quite shocking. I felt, I felt you know, quite intimidated uh, by his reaction to me um, because I simply suggested some thoughts for him to think about and I thought he was going to rip my face off. Um, so, so there's a lot of polarization out there about Israel and I kind of say the church hasn't always helped itself by some of the things we put out there on social media which are far too generic and far too unconsidered in our reflections. And that would, this would be from someone who, who would be more pro an idea of Israel than against. Paul helps us to think about Israel. And if you want some reflections on this, Romans chapter 9, Romans chapter 10, and Romans chapter 11 are crucial to help you think about how God thinks about Israel, not just then, but now, and then how we can then think about Israel in the light of that, looking at modern events and what is going on. Is, is that okay to try and help you? I'm going to give you a bit of a whistle-stop tour here just to help you. We can lean into more detail later if this helps. When you read Romans chapter 9, 10, and 11, there are essentially three big ideas that Paul gives us about Israel. The first idea is rooted in Israel's past election in chapter 9. And look at what Paul says in these uh, amazing words that are coming up for you. He says this, theirs, that's Israel, theirs is the adoption of sonship, theirs the divine glory, the covenants, the receiving of the law, the temple worship and the promises. Theirs are the patriarchs and, uh, patriarchs and from them is traced the human ancestry of Messiah who is God over all forever praised. Amen. So here's what Paul is helping us with and establishing, first of all, is that, that Israel, as Paul is writing, was a people elected by God. But why are they elected? Well, they're not elected just for salvation. They have been elected for service. Israel has been elected to carry God to their world. And Paul makes that argument passionately in the context of his uh, uh, chapter nine uh, of Romans. And he's saying that God set them up and give them all of this so that they would represent God to the world and they would example God to the world. And this is echoed in Exodus 19, where God describes the people of Israel at Mount Sinai as a kingdom of priests and a holy nation or a, a royal nation, a holy nation unto God. And the idea here is that Israel will be a nation that examples God 
and a nation that will carry God. So Israel's election was so that they would carry God to the world. Now, now look at this. Paul goes on to make this argument. It is not the children by physical descent who are God's children, but it is the children of the promise who are regarded as, as Abraham's offspring. So Paul is starting to show us this little idea that when God chose Israel, he wasn't just choosing an idea of ethnicity, but he was choosing a people to represent him and carry him to the world. And Paul is already suggesting, and you can see this also in the book of Galatians, that it's possible to be a Jewish person by ethnicity, but not be a Jewish person by promise. It's possible to have your flesh cut, but not your heart. It's possible to be born a Jew, but not be in covenant with God. That's a big argument of Paul. Now we should listen to Paul because Paul was a hardcore Jew. Paul was a Hebrew of the Hebrews from the Pharisee community. Paul knew the Torah inside out. Paul really understood this. And yet Paul is now showing us, hold it a minute, hold it a minute. Israel has sort of lost its way because Israel was never meant to be elected and keep God to themselves. Israel was meant to carry God to the world. And we are Israel not because our flesh is cut, but because our hearts are cut. I like what Andrew Allerton says in the context of his beautiful uh, little book, Romans, a letter that makes sense of life. He says, Paul's argument makes a vital distinction between Jewish ethnicity that is visible and divine election that is unseen. And what he means is this. Paul is showing us that a person can be Jewish ethnically, but that doesn't mean they are in covenant relationship with God. And the ultimate test of that covenant relationship with God is the acceptance or the rejection of the Messiah. And this is exactly the point he makes at the end of chapter nine. And it's a bit of a sorrowful point for Paul. And if you read it carefully, here's what Paul says, because they pursued the things of God, not by faith, but as if it were by works. They stumbled over the stumbling stone. So in other words, Paul says, here's a people who were called by God to be the example of God and the exporters of God and the ultimate, the ultimate contribution that Israel will make to the world is that the Messiah of the world will come out of Israel. And that Messiah will not just be the Messiah for Israel, but the Messiah from Israel to the world. And Paul sorrowfully makes the argument that even though Messiah came out of Israel, Israel itself has stumbled over that Messiah. And therefore, his conclusion is, it's possible to be cut in flesh, but not cut in heart. It's possible to be ethnically Jewish, but not a son or daughter of the promise. And it's possible to be born a Jew, but not in covenant with the Lord. That's a big idea. Now you've, you've got to grab that because Paul makes that argument constantly. And Galatians is a masterful unpacking of that. Now, if you hold that, then when we go into chapter 10, it makes sense of some of the stuff that he says here. And he talks about Israel's present hope. Now stay with me, you're doing great. He says this, verse one, chapter 10, brothers and sisters, my heart's desire and prayer to God for the Israelites is that they may be saved. Now just pause here. Note that, that they may be saved. But if, if they are the special election people of God, they're already saved, right? But Paul's already made this argument. No, no, it is possible to be part of the ethnic identity of Israel, but not embrace the heart of the Israel of God, not enter into covenant and relationship with the Lord. And of course, for him, the rejection of Jesus as a Messiah is the big stumbling point. So he's hoping then that the Israel that produced the Messiah will themselves be saved and come to a place of salvation. He goes on to say these words. Look at this in verses 11 and 13. As the scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame 
For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, in our 21st century Christian world, we use that as an invitation to anyone coming to Jesus on a Sunday morning, for example. But in the context, Paul is using that as an appeal to both Jew and Gentile. He's saying to both the Jewish people listening to him and the Gentile people listening to him that actually any one of them who calls on the name of the Lord and the, the Lord there in that context is specifically the Messiah, Jesus. That if you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. And this is a massive idea for Paul that he wants Jesus to be the person who breaks down the dividing wall between Jew and Gentile so that it forms one dynamic person in him. And so what's our response to that? Paul says, proclaim the gospel. And he, he argues, how will they hear unless someone tells them? And how will that happen unless somebody goes? And actually, how will somebody go unless they're sent? And then he goes on to say these beautiful words, quoting Isaiah, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. So here's what Paul wants. He wants for the good news of the Messiah to be embraced by Israel. If Israel embraces the good news of the Messiah, then they become not only Israel in flesh, but Israel in heart. Paul in Galatians refers to those who have had their heart cut as the Israel of God. Are you with me so far? Now, I'm going to make an important point at the end. I know I'm maybe making your head hurt here, but stay with me. But here's Paul's challenge. He says this as he concludes in chapter 10. He says, but not all Israelites have accepted the good news. So Paul is now showing us that actually we can look at Israel and it looks like Israel, but, but actually there's an Israel that accepts God and an Israel that doesn't accept the Messiah. And there's a differentiation appearing here. And this leads us to chapter 11, uh, quite a glorious and controversial conclusion, Israel's future place. And again, look at the language here. Paul starts the chapter by saying, I ask you then, did God reject his people? By no means. So it feels like when you're following Paul, it feels like God is done with Israel and it's now all Gentiles. But Paul warns us as he comes to the conclusion here, no, 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 God hasn't finished with his people yet. He's got a plan for them, something that he wants to do. And in fact, if you read on into chapter 11, he repeats that question almost identically, rhetorically. Again, I asked, did they stumble so as to fall beyond recovery? Not at all. And then Paul gives us an amazing image, the image of the olive tree. And here's what he sort of says. Here's how he summarizes the argument. Think of Israel this called elected people, he says, called to bring God to the world. Think of them as an olive tree. And he says this, the branches that are Israel have been broken off. The unbelieving Israel, the branches have been broken off. The Israel that's rejected the Messiah, the branches have been broken off. And what's happened in its place? The Gentile world or those who are willing to believe the Messiah, whether they be Jewish or Gentile, have been grafted in to their place. And Paul warns us, warns me and you Gentiles, just because you've been grafted in because a branch was broken off, don't get arrogant. Don't get full of yourself. Because Paul warns us, if God broke off the original branch, how much more would he break off the grafted branch? So don't be arrogant. If you've been grafted in, Paul is saying, it is because God wants to make his people envious. And why would God want to make his people envious? So that he can position them for an incredible breakthrough. Paul says this, look at this language. He says, but they were broken off because of unbelief and you stand by faith. Says to me and you, do not be arrogant, but tremble. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not also spare the grafted in branches. Big idea. And all of that breaking off and grafting in is for what purpose? It's to provoke Israel to jealousy. 
so that Israel will come to a place of desperation and call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of their Messiah. Again, I love what Andrew Ollerton says. We're drawing this to a close. He says this, God's ultimate purpose is to use this Gentile engrafting to stimulate a new growth in Israel. Though Israel was broken off as a result of rejecting their Messiah, one day God will graft them back in. Jew and Gentile will finally bear fruit together to the glory of God. So we get a complicated argument in, in, in uh, chapters 9, 10, and 11. Let me summarize it for you. Israel were elected. Why were they elected? Not to be superior or special, but to carry God to the nations of the world. Tragically and terribly, they stumbled over that journey. And even when eventually the Messiah came out of their own loins to save the world, they stumbled over that Messiah and rejected him. But Paul says this, the door for Israel is not closed. God has grafted in the Gentiles to provoke Israel so that Israel will eventually believe and return to the Messiah. So how do we conclude? How does it help us to think about Israel when we're looking at the TV and watching the Gaza-Israel war, for example? Here's a couple of things in concluding, and then I will draw this to a close. You've been amazing. Thank you for listening so well. First of all this, Israel's restoration is a sign. It's one of the signs on the board that we should pay attention to. Whether you like Israel, don't like Israel, pro-Israel or anti-Israel is not the issue. For the follower of Jesus, we recognize that Jesus said something about the trampling of this nation and the restoration of this nation. And literally in the last 100 years, we have seen this incredible restoration against all the odds of what we identify today as the state of Israel. Whatever you think about it, it is a sign of the end times. It's a sign pointing that Jesus is returning. But there is Israel and Israel. And when we follow the trajectory of the New Testament without in any way becoming or falling foul of accusations of anti-Semitism, we are given permission to distinguish between an ethnic understanding of Israel and a covenantal understanding of Israel. Now, I've been to Israel three times and it might, it might shock you. Israel's really a secular state. It's not very religious at all. Um, and, and probably, I, I would say, if you've studied the Bible seriously throughout your life, which I have, I probably know more of the Torah than most Israeli Jews do. All right. And I'm a Christian. I'm a Gentile. Right. Because uh, actually, you, you would go to certain parts of Israel and not even know you were in Israel. Sometimes Christians think, you know, it's like it's this gorgeous, amazing, utopic sort of experience, but, but it's not. It's, it's, it's a lot of interesting things going on there. But what's really interesting is the messianic community within Israel is growing. More and more young Jewish people are turning to Jesus Messiah and they're having their eyes open to him in the most dramatic and powerful way. And that is happening. And actually, this is what Paul is talking about, that actually it's possible to look at Israel and yet it's not Israel. So sometimes what we see as political Israel is not really the Israel that God was after. All right? Now that doesn't excuse any form of anti-Israel uh, or anti-Semitic behavior or anti-anybody behavior. We should be eradicating that from the church. But it does give me permission to look at certain things and say that's wrong. Just because it's Israel doesn't mean it's right. And I would suggest to you, ladies and gentlemen, and I don't want to overcook this, but if Jesus was around today, he would have some stuff to say to Israel. If the prophets were around, I think they would have things to say. Now, am I trying to be judgmental on, on any... 
listen, having grown up in Belfast, I, I know how difficult these moments can be for all sorts of people groups. So I'm not judging anybody. But what it's allowed me to do as a Christian is actually be, in the most biblical sense, pro-Israel. From an understanding of God's idea of Israel, I am pro-Israel. But it also allows me to distinguish God's idea of Israel from some of the things I'm seeing in Israel. Are you, are you with me? So it allows me to hold on to Israel as a sign of the end times. It allows me to celebrate the good. It also allows me to question the bad. Are you with me? And one of the mistakes I think that sometimes, especially the Pentecostal church in the West has fallen into, is that we're so pro-Israel, then Israel as a modern identity can do no wrong. And I think that's a mistake. I think that's a mistake. And that's from someone who's spent much of his life wrapped up in the Hebrew Bible, okay? Uh, and I love Israel as, as God, a God identity. And Paul loves Israel, but he's desperate that Israel finds the Messiah and the Messiah finds Israel. Does that make sense to you? Israel will be saved, but only through Messiah. There is not a two-track salvation process. There's not a track for Gentiles and then a special, like, fast track for Jews. Do you understand me? If a Jewish person cut in the flesh rejects Jesus Messiah, that Jewish person will perish. In the same way that if a Gentile person rejects Jesus Messiah, then they will perish. And therefore Israel will be saved. Israel will see, as it were, their Messiah and respond. And I think that's going to be another little thing to watch on the board. Is the acceptance of Jesus Messiah in and from a Jewish worldview point of view. And I think that's something for us to watch. I believe we can be both committed to and challenging of Israel when we understand what Paul was saying. I hope that, we're very, very fast there, but I hope that helps you. So, so when Jesus says to us, watch continuously, remember, this is a command and it's a continuous command. Why are we being called to watch? Number one, because we don't exactly know when. So don't worry about that and don't try and work that out. Nothing's going to help you, not even in the book of Revelation, it's going to help you with that idea. But even though we don't know when, Jesus himself, and we'll talk about Paul as well in the other sessions, Jesus gives us big ideas, five outstanding signs, a sixth if we include Israel. And if we include an understanding of those ideas into the teaching of Jesus, then here's what's happening. We're looking at our world, sitting in that departure lounge in the, in the airport. We've got one eye on the board and we know it's going to go green really, really soon. So our call is to keep our eye on the board while getting on with our world. As we're paying our mortgage, keep your eye on the board. As we're raising our kids, keep your eye on the board. As we are doing church together, keep your eye on the board. Christians should be people who understand the imperative to watch. Watch continuously so that even when that day happens and that trumpet blows and it'll surprise us all, yet we're not caught unready. But even though surprised, we are ready for his return. Therefore, keep watch because you do not know. And I want to encourage you to think about that. Don't become obsessed with it. Don't become anxious about it. But don't ignore it. For me, I am more hope-filled about the future than ever. I'm probably more pessimistic about humanity, because I think our world is getting worse, but I am genuinely hopeful because all of these things point to the return of Jesus and our opportunities to reach and touch our world because he is returning. 
And we need to think about that more. We need to celebrate it more. We need to proclaim it more. And we need to stand more confidently upon it. And in our next two sessions, we'll think about ways in which we can do that. <sighs> Is that okay? Um, what, would you, do you want to close now or do you want to... Great. Okay. So, uh, listen, I'm hanging around because um, we ha had hoped to give a wee bit more time for questions and uh, it just got away from me. Please forgive me. That's down to my bad management. That's not your fault. Um, I'm hanging around for a few minutes. If you've got a burning question, do that. But we will definitely make time for questions in the other sessions. And if I can't answer them, I will. Is that okay? Will you stand with me if you can? You've been sitting a long time. Your backsides must be completely numb by now. So well done, everybody. <clears throat> this conversation seems ancient, seems almost out of step, and yet it's absolutely relevant to our world. If ever the Christian community needed to rediscover its confidence in the return of Jesus, it is today. Our world is a mess. Our world is in absolute chaos. And even the so-called sophisticated bits of our world, the so-called civilized parts of our world are in absolute mayhem. And underneath the surface of all that order, is just chaos lurking. And that shouldn't depress me and you, but hopefully it should remind us that our hope is not in our government. And that's not an anti-budget, anti-government speech. Okay, I'm for our government, whoever the color. I want our government to be the best they can be, but our future, our hope's not in our government. It's not in Europe. It's not in China. It's not in the world markets. It's not in Elon Musk or the future president of the United States. These people will come and go and all of them have their own agenda. Our hope, our blessed hope, is in the risen, resurrected Savior who will return. And when we really get that in our spirit, even with our eye on the board and even with the signs appearing before our eyes, it will not cause us to be anxious, but it will cause us to be hope-filled and positive as we seek to be a light in the darkness and hope to the chaos of our world. So Lord Jesus, we thank you that you came the first time. We are here because you came the first time. And we are saved because of your grace and mercy. And Lord, we thank you for the promise that you are going to come a second time. And Lord, whatever that looks like and whenever that happens, we are sure it is closer than it has ever been. And in one sense, Lord, we, know, we understand that chronologically. Of course, it's closer. It has to be closer. But Lord, as we look at our world, we are more convinced than ever that we are closer. And though we don't just want to sit in the lounge and look at the board, but we want to be men and women with one eye on the board, watching, waiting, and working. We want to be men and women who live with hope, live with confidence, live with a sense, oh God, of realizing that however good our lives are, this is not the totality of our call, our experience, and our existence. And Lord, we look to you to be at the center of this proclamation. As we're coming towards Easter and we're thinking about the death and resurrection of you, Lord Jesus, may we also celebrate the fact that as the resurrected King, you will return to the earth and you will call those who are your own and you will wrap up and consummate the universe and our creation ultimately for your glory and for your honor. So Lord Jesus, may the truth of the return live within us and may we as men and women followers of Jesus watch continuously for your return in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Bless you.